Okay, good afternoon. And uh, thanks for joining us. I'm Andrew Silo Carroll. I'm editor at large for the New York Jewish Week and managing editor for ideas at JTA. Uh, welcome to a discussion about a simple question with a complicated answer. What was it like to be a Jewish soldier during the American Civil War? Our guest, historian Adam Mendelson, had unprecedented access to a new and vast database of Jewish soldiers, which we'll describe shortly, and is able to tell their stories in his new book, Jewish Soldiers in the Civil War, the Union Army. It's a story about battlefield blood, sweat, and tears, but also about Jewish identity in the 19th century, anti-Semitism, and becoming American. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to thank Thea Weaseltier, Mara Swift, and Rebecca Phillips, and the whole staff at JTA and 70 Faces for making this event possible. So first, I want to introduce our guest. Adam Mendelson is director of the Kaplan Center for Jewish Studies and Associate Professor of History at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. He's the co-editor of Jews in the Civil War, a reader uh, with Jonathan Sarna, and also with Jonathan Sarna, yearning to breathe free Jews in Gilded Age America. He's co-editor of the journal Jewish Historical Studies and previously co-edited the journal American Jewish History. So Adam, welcome. Thank you, delighted to uh, to be here. I wanted to start with your background uh, before we get into the meat of this, which is uh, where does a nice Jewish boy from South Africa get an interest in the American Civil War? It's a very good question. Uh, so um, I, I stumbled into an interest in American Jewish history. I, 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 I as you've already said, I'm, I'm from South Africa and I, and I originally spent a lot of time doing research on South African Jews. And, and then I was looking for a point of comparison to what is distinctive, if anything, about South African Jewish history. So I decided to compare South African Jewish experience with the experience of Jews in the American South. And, and it really grew, grew from there. That, that's uh, in a sense of, uh, of, of um, a whole range of commonalities and, and interesting differences between American and, and Southern, Jewish, uh, Southern Jewish and South African Jewish experience. And uh, then I, I, uh, and I had the good fortune to, uh, to, to work with Jonathan Sarner originally on, on a project looking at the Civil War. And, and uh, th this book is, is the, the consequence of that many, many years later. So, and I, and I think we'll get into probably some also the racial background of, 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 of a lot of these tensions in history. But let's start with, your book is based on something called the Chappelle Roster of Jewish Service in the American Civil War. Who is Benjamin Chappelle? And tell us, what is this roster and how did it help you in your research? It's an extraordinary undertaking, uh, something, a project which really began in 2009 and was the, the brainchild of, of Benjamin Chappelle, who, who's uh, been a collector of uh, material relating to the American presidents, to, to, to the Civil War and, and to American Jewish history for, for many, many years. And uh, he set out in 2009 to answer what was a seemingly a, a straightforward question, how many Jews fought in the, the Civil War and who were these Jews who fought in, in the Civil War? And a research team has worked ever since and still working on exactly this question. They, they started by focusing primarily on the, the Union and now are very much at work on the, the Confederacy. And they, they've, what they've tried to do is to confirm that uh, individuals both were Jewish, which is deceptively, again, difficult to do, and served in either the Union or Confederate Army. And in assembling this, what's become the, the Chappelle roster, which is now a, a website, a, a database, which is open to researchers, open to the public, in, open to anyone who's interested in, in this topic, uh, what, they, what they've done is assembled a tremendous amount of material uh, about uh, individuals who, who fought. So, so all the material they collected in confirming uh, that these individuals both were Jewish and were, were Civil War uh, veterans. And it really provides us both with this overview of a, a sort of broad snapshot of uh, you know, Jewish service during the war, but also allows you to hone in on individuals as well. So I first gained access to this database in, in 2016 and, and then spent a number of years working with it, so looking at both these individual cases and at collective Jewish experience uh, during the war. But, that's, uh, but certainly uh, what I've done is only really, I think, the tip of the iceberg. It's, it's a wonderful resource for anyone who's interested in, in this topic. So I get the feeling I, I, I don't want to, I feel like I'm not supposed to ask this because I saw something in your book about it's difficult, but how many Jews are we talking about who fought 
on the north side on the um, uh, for the Confederacy and out of a population of how many in America at this time? That's a good good question. So uh, they're, they're, they're roughly 150,000 Jews in America in, in 1861, so at the beginning of the Civil War. Most of them are, are recent arrivals. They're, they're Jews who've immigrated in the you know, a decade or two decades prior to, to the war. And uh, of them, the majority live in the states which will comprise the, the, the North, will comprise the, the Union during, during the war. And so perhaps 125,000 out of the 150,000 are in the, the, the Union, and, and about 25,000 are in the, uh, in, in the Confederacy. Uh, so, um, and, and as I've described that in both cases, there are, most of them are, are, are newcomers to, uh, to, to the United States. And, and yet uh, significant numbers do, do enlist. Uh, again, the, the Chappelle roster, what it has tried to do is to, is to uh, both identify you know, as, as many cases as possible, but as I've already described, to be as exact as possible as well, to apply very strict criteria to, to ensure that, that those who, who are identified are uh, there's evidence to back up, uh, back up the, 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 the case for them. Uh, and they've identified uh, um, just over 1,700 Jews who fought for the, the Union Army, uh, many more who are unconfirmed, the cases where we know they're Jewish, but we're uncertain of their service, or they, we know that they serve, but we are not 100% sure that they are, in fact, uh, Jewish. Um, so, so the number undoubtedly was, was significantly higher, but, but you know, 17, just over 1,700 who we sure are, are you know, Jews who fought in the, the Union Army. And when it comes to the Confederacy, it's a work in progress. This is what the the Chappelle roster research team is working at the, on at the moment, and it's more than a thousand already. Um, so, so you can tell already that there a, a larger proportion of Jews in the Confederacy enlisted uh, on behalf of or in the Confederate Army, but but not necessarily for straightforward reasons. Right now, remind readers that your first volume is about the Union Army, so we're going to be talking mostly about the North today. Um, I want to ask about the makeup of the Jewish community at this point in America. You said they're mostly newcomers. I guess this is this is the 1860s, so we're still talking about a largely German Jewish population. But your book also talks about that hides a lot of diversity among the Jewish population and the troops themselves. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So, so um, we, we are uh, used to thinking of the, the great wave of immigration to America in a, uh, in, um, prior to the Civil War as, as being a, a German-Jewish wave of, of immigration. Uh, but, but as you've, uh, your question suggests, uh, that their population in, is very internally diverse, that they're, they're people who are coming from uh, very different parts. There is no Germany at the time. There are a whole collection of, of kingdoms and principalities and states, which, which later will form uh, Germany. Um, but likewise, there are, are um, uh, those who, who come from places further east as well. There are a number of, of Jews who are clearly from, from Poland or some, some from Russia too. But those who come from Central Europe, those who come from the, the Germanic states, uh, they, uh, they uh, not all are, in, in fact, uh, German-speaking. And, and many of them, uh, their identities that they bring with them are often local identities. They, they think of themselves as Jews from a very in a particular town, a particular uh, region, a particular state, there isn't necessarily a, a pan-German or pan-Central European sense of Jewish identity at, at this point in time. And one of the things, in fact, one of the things, the claims that my book uh, makes, one of the arguments that I make, is that the, the war uh, leads to a coalescence of a sense of identity, uh, of American Jewish identity, out of these very, very diverse uh, immigrants who arrive at, at, at this time. Uh, for, for all sorts of reasons connected with some of the adversity uh, during the war itself. But they're not the only immigrants uh, who, who arrive uh, prior to, to the war, Jewish immigrants who arrive. In fact, as the book uh, demonstrates, there are uh, you know, Jewish immigrants from a whole variety of other uh, places, from the Ottoman Empire, from other parts of, of Europe, uh, from uh, North Africa, it's, uh, from the Caribbean. And so it's, it's an internally diverse American Jewish population at this point in time, and one which has grown dramatically in a very, very short space of time. So, so the Jewish population, which is relatively small in the 1830s, is, is growing exponentially, exponentially in the 1840s and 1850s to reach this, this the size of 150,000. Most of this uh, population, as I've described, are, are immigrants. There's a relatively small native-born Jewish population in 1861. So let's talk, wait, I want to talk about the ways the experience of Jewish soldiers was both similar to and distinct from other soldiers. And I think at one point you even talk about their, I guess they're, they're sort of isolated. They're not, they don't come in as a, there's no Jewish battalion 
but th these are soldiers who were scattered among many, many different different troops and 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 regions. So, so scattered is the right word to 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 use to describe them. And and here again, historical background is is very useful and important to understand uh, um, the Jewish experience during the war itself. Uh, that, that Jews had had arrived, as I described, in, in a relatively short space of time prior to the war. A number of them had flocked to, to larger cities like New York and Philadelphia and Cincinnati, for example. But many others had moved into the countryside as itinerant peddlers, as, as hawkers, as people, again, opening up small shops in the countryside. And this was different from many other immigrant groups, this pattern of dispersion amongst Jews, the fact that they they, they had this uh, uh, significant rural uh, presence and often you know, Jews living in relatively isolated conditions in the countryside and again encountering other Jews and seeking out other Jews when they, they went to a larger town, but often living these rather isolated lives. The other piece of critical information to understand is how the, the Union Army recruited uh, during the war. And recruitment was localized, that regiments were raised in particular uh, towns or particular regions. And uh, again, it's sort of state-based uh, enlistment uh, during the war, which meant that, uh, that recruiting officers would, would recruit uh, neighbors and people from a particular, a particular small uh, area, which meant that when Jews did enlist, those in the countryside enlisted, they often again were enlisting alongside their, their neighbors and friends and, and others, uh, but very few of those neighbors were, were Jews. So it meant that many of these regiments, which are raised in, in, in rural areas or outside uh, larger cities, it meant that the, the pattern amongst, uh, amongst Jews who enlist is that they are amongst very, very few other Jews. And a regiment has a thousand men, and it's typical for Jews to serve in, a, in amongst you know in a regiment of a thousand men to have a, a handful of other Jews in that larger larger reg regiment. There are very very few regiments in the Union Army which have more than than ten or even twenty Jews uh, within within its ranks, and that's different from other ethnic groups. And again, and here geography is is important. That um, that Irish and, and Germans and Scandinavians and others tend to live in denser knots and denser clusters in, in in cities and even in the countryside, as well. So when they enlist, they, they again often are in companies where there are lots of other Germans or Irish or Scandinavians. Uh, so their experience is different because of the, of that fact that that there is often a a community of others around them who, who share a particular identity, who can come to each other's aid, who who who, who uh, have a similar background. And for, for Jews, um, it, it's much more of an isolated, uh, a typical Jews, much more isolated than, than other ethnic groups, um, than soldiers from other ethnic groups. And likewise, another important factor here is that, uh, that there's a certain diffidence, for reasons we can talk about later, uh, amongst some Jews about the war itself. Uh, again, it relates to the experience of anti-Semitism very early on uh, in, in the war. And we see a different pattern again amongst other ethnic groups where, again, particularly amongst the Irish and amongst Germans, uh, that the war initially is very positive for them. It's a way of that they've prior to the war, they've been excluded in, uh, from American society and have encountered nativism, xenophobia uh, prior to the war. And suddenly there's the war offers this opportunity to rally around the flag, to be accepted. And for Jews, it's different. For Jews, it's instead they they encounter this, this very very nasty anti-Semitism early on in the war, which, which turns a number of them them off, and also obviously plays into then how you know how they enlist and who enlists as well. So that anti-Semitism, do you mean that they encounter it um, when they're mustered they're among their their sergeants, among their fellow among their fellow enlistees? Um, how is that manifested? It's a, a good question. So, so I have some images here which can uh, which, which can demonstrate exactly this. There certainly is that individual uh, level of of en encounters with anti-Semitism. That's in, in a way a different uh, experience. But if we can pull up some of some of the the, the images, I can show you what, what I'm describing. It's very much anti-Semitism on on the, on the home front. Uh, this is these are ideas about about Jews. And in fact, I think the the uh, the fourth slide over here. This is absolutely would be a good one to to start with. This is a typical cartoon from the, the, the first summer of the war. This is in, in, in the summer of 1861. This idea really uh, takes hold. Uh, you can see this in this cartoon, it's entitled Shoddy Patriotism. We have a recruiting sergeant who, who's speaking to a man who's supposed to be a, a, a Jewish merchant. And he says to, come, says to him, come Moses, rub up your patriotism and join the union forces. And the Jew who's depicted in the stereotypical way says, mein Gott, no, he's supposed to be a, a German. 
I have as much as I can do to supply the army with uh, good uniforms upon which I make nothing at all. So help me God. He's saying, in other words, I'm going to, I'm not going to enlist. Instead, I'm going to supply the army with shoddy uh, uniforms. And this is an idea uh, rooted in uh, the, uh, the scandals over um, um, uh, military supply over the first months of the war. That the, the Union Army in 1861, prior to the war, is 15,000 strong. The entire federal army, sorry, is, is, is 15,000 strong, a small professional army prior to the war. And um, that army will grow dramatically in size very, very quickly in, in the first months of the war and then over the war itself until 2 million men have served in Union uniform. And all those uniforms have to be produced at great speed early on in the war to, to supply this growing uh, army. And there is uh, tremendous uh, corruption in, in military supply, in particularly in that first year of the war there, because the demand is so great in there and the, the military systems can't cope with this, with the, with the demand either. And there are unscrupulous contractors who take advantage of this, most notably in you know, Brooks Brothers, the, the clothing firm today, that they, they are they're implicated in, in these scandals, it's not a Jewish firm, implicated in these scandals in 1861. But what happens in the press is that the contractors are often, as this cartoon demonstrates, depicted as, as Jews. And the idea and, and sort of Jew and contractor are used interchangeably. In, and this is, again, in the early, early months of the war. You can just imagine what the experience is like for Jews on the home front who are being asked to sacrifice for them uh, to enlist in this patriotic cause, to, to abandon their businesses, to leave their, their families, to enlist. And instead, what they're hearing is this drumbeat on the home front in, in newspapers of crass anti-Semitism of this kind. And you can imagine what this does to their motivation. And again, I think it persuades many of them that you know, better to, to, to stay home than, than to enlist. You know, plenty do enlist, but certainly it has a, a particular negative effect on Jews, which is different from Germans and Irish at this point in time who are being celebrated for their patriotism. Jews have this, this different experience. Mm -hmm. And then when they arrive uh, in camp, does that continue for them or or, or do they, um, because I know you wrote a piece for JTA, um, very different experiences from two different soldiers. Mm -hmm, absolutely. really felt, he, you know, classic anti-Semitism and the other one who felt, wow, I was, I was treated really well. Absolutely. There really is a lot of, a lot of variety uh, in terms of experience. Look, a, a number of Jews hide their identities. I mean, they're, they're a significant proportion who adopt aliases. Uh, so, so in other words, choose to conceal uh, their, their identities rather than, I think, take the risk of not knowing what will happen if you, if you are, again, a Jew in a, uh, in a, perhaps with very few other Jews in a regiment of a thousand men who, who are, in many cases, perfect strangers to you. And, and again, imagine the wartime environment. This is a uh, soldiers who are thrown together, that's incredibly stressful. Uh, they're uh, again, uh, and also to pressures and, and uncertainties, anxieties of all time, that perhaps revealing your Jewishness might be seen as something which is best not, not done, or at least not initially. So we certainly see examples of that. And, but also we see the, the you know, examples of, of soldiers who, who find that their Jewishness is, is, is again, treated with a sense of excitement by, by other soldiers too, that they've never met a Jew, the classic sort of a philo-Semitic uh, response. So we have an account, for example, of a Jewish soldier who describes uh, you know, uh, marching with his, his company and being pulled aside by an officer who's so excited to, to meet a live, real, living Jew. So we have that sort of uh, experience. But then we have a number of examples uh, which are which really reveal uh, misery on the part of, of Jews. Who, so, for example, um, a soldier called Max Glass, a really hard luck case, uh, an immigrant who's who enlists, he's cheated out of his enlistment uh, um, payment. He he and, and 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 then has the misfortune of joining a a, a regiment which is where, where he's a newcomer. It's quite a well established uh, regiment. And he uh, and he's quickly um, becomes the the butt of of jokes by by he claims sort of Irish Catholic soldiers within within his regiment, and they torment him in all sorts of quite vicious ways that they uh, they pelt him with with mud. They they um, this, this other forms of physical abuse. They they they, they, they um, you know, shout at him. Uh, they chase him, etc. And and here it's a case where he ultimately again. Um, he, he appeals for aid from his commanding officer, and his commanding officer is unsympathetic uh, to him. Uh, so, so ultimately, he he deserts, uh, and uh, he's caught, he's imprisoned, and uh, he he uh, appeals to a, a the commanding general, who's much more sympathetic to him, and in fact um, 
allows them to to escape punishment for for, for desertion. What's interesting about the that case is that the general who who's sympathetic to him is a, a notorious anti-Semite, uh, Benjamin Butler, who otherwise is, has all sorts of very unfavorable things to say about Jews. When it comes to this Jewish individual, is much more uh, sympathetic. And they're, they're, and again, this this sort of variety is is evident elsewhere. That. For example, another soldier who we have uh, a very poignant uh, material relating to is a soldier by the name of uh, Joseph A. Joel, who, who is a himself an English immigrant, young man. Uh, you know, um, he he has the misfortune again of enlisting in a in a higher regiment uh, where uh, he he's uh, it's it's a regiment where again he's a peddler, he's in the countryside, uh, he he's alone as a Jew within this within this uh, within his company. And again, uh, it, it, you know, the, his fellow soldiers uh, pick on him. They they replace his his sugar with salt. They tie his shoelaces, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, together. And things of this kind. He appeals to to the lieutenant colonel of his regiment to be moved to a a different company. His lieutenant colonel is Rutherford B. Hayes, who will later go on to become a, a president of the United States. And and uh, uh, Rutherford B. Hayes is deeply sympathetic to him, moves him to another regiment, and they form then this lifelong friendship, uh, um, which, which in fact, um, Joseph A. Joel names one of his children after Rutherford B. Hayes. So, so, and they, they correspond, uh, you know, when, when he is, uh, when, when, when he's present, et cetera. So, so that sort of variety, that it's really a sort of very human uh, experience for, uh, for Jewish soldiers. And, uh, you know, sometimes they are lucky and sometimes they are unlucky in terms of, of you know, who they, who they encounter. Mm -hmm. There are two there are two famous events during the war that I always associate with Jews in the Civil War. One is uh, Grant's Order Number 11, which was about, I think goes back to the Shadi cartoon about keeping Jewish profiteers out of the region uh, where he was general. Um, I want to talk about that, but I also want to talk about one um, uh, which is about a, a, a chaplain. A Jewish chaplain who was who and and I and I is this the same event in where Lincoln personally intervened on the behalf of a New York rabbi and and I think your book does something it it tells the true story I think the story has been very much distorted over the last hundred and fifty years so maybe let's start with that one before we talk about General Grant absolutely so so it's it's it's, it's a um, and as you've correctly identified these are the two best known episodes involving Jews during the war and really rare moments during the war where, where Jews are you know, front and center in terms of national attention uh, as well that that both of these issues you know, generate a, a, a lot of discussion on the home front or covered in the press etc and the chaplaincy question is, a, is an interesting one uh, because um again uh, with the 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 mushrooming uh, mushrooming of the 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 union army it's it's dramatic growth in size and uh, there's concern about the the spiritual welfare of, of soldiers and the again there's a history prior to the war of appointing uh, chaplains and the decision is made uh, uh, early on in the war uh, that uh, regiments will be allowed to appoint uh, chaplains of their own the officers of the regiment will will elect a chaplain and the wording of what becomes the the, the um, congressional act which uh, ratifies this says that the a chaplain has to be a, um, a a member of a christian denomination um a regiment uh, again an interesting regiment in in raised in, in philadelphia um commanded by a a man by the name of, of max friedman in fact we have an image of of his recruiting poster which i could point i can show you and also an image of his his camp. Uh, this is absolutely the Cameron uh, Dragoons over here, named after the Secretary of War. Uh, you can see Colonel Max uh, Friedman commanding. It's a cavalry regiment. You can see again uh, the, the the image of of uh, and again this this regiment in camp on on the right hand side. And Max Friedman himself is a a man who has pre war militia experience in the Pennsylvania uh, militia, and he does what a number of other uh, patriots do at the time, which is try and and this is very, very early on in the war. This is April of, of 1861. Try to, to to raise a regiment, to raise a thousand men who who will then uh, be uh, um, mustered into the the Union Army. Um, and um, so he raises a regiment in in uh, which includes many you know, individuals that that he knows. And he does what something which is fairly typical of, of the time, which is to appoint uh, as as officers. Uh, individuals who are connected with him, so family members and, and, and others, and he selects as so, so um, this regiment and its, its officers will select as their um, as their chaplain a 
a man by the name of Michael Allen, who, who does have a, he doesn't have a rabbinic training, but certainly is, is a, he, he um, has a religious background. He, he's a bit of a religious uh, scholar. He's also a liquor dealer as well. And that might perhaps, I speculate, relate to the appointment as well, because one of the things which is typical of, of, um, of, of union regiments and their officers, particularly early in the war, is that there's a lot of, there's potential profit in, in controlling alcohol sales, et cetera. And maybe this was on Max Friedman, the Colonel's mind. We, we again, I, I don't know for certain, but Michael Allen, in fact, is the, the, the chaplain then effectively of this regiment for at least a, a month uh, before uh, he resigns. And again, there's a, the, the uh, traditional way of understanding, uh, the way that other historians have understood his resignation is that a, a member of the YMCA visits the camp and is aghast to discover that there's a, a Jewish chaplain and, and a protests, and this then persuades uh, you know, Michael Allen to resign, and, and from this create a scandal emerges. Um, so that's the, and, and then um, you know, Jews uh, in the Jewish community in uh, wanting to change the law, this again, this is the traditional narrative, they find, they develop a test case, they find a, 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 a well-positioned uh, individual to, uh, to a man by the name of Arnold Fischl to, to uh, who, who has, again, he's, not, he's a cousin, rather rabbi, but, but uh, that persuade him to, to seek out the chaplaincy of this regiment, and you know, again, it creates the yeah, uh, creates a scandal, of public public attention, and ultimately this it comes to the attention of Lincoln, and the law is changed. That's the traditional uh, narrative. Instead, what I've discovered is something more complicated. The first part of the story is certainly true that that Michael Allen is briefly the uh, the chaplain of this regiment, but it seems to be that that he resigns probably for other reasons. That uh, he he's, um, doesn't much enjoy uh, his brief period of, of military service. He's away from, from his family, for example, during the high holidays in, in September of 1861, etc. cetera. Uh, and that the man who, who replaces them is, or, or at least seeks his, his, to be his replacement, is the man is Arnold Fischl, who, who has recently lost his position in a, uh, in a prestigious uh, New York uh, synagogue. And uh, he does actually seek out this position, but it's not with the connivance or, or involvement of Max Friedman at all. In fact, Max Friedman is himself aghast to discover that Arnold Fischl has applied for this for this position of chaplain. And in fact, he rushes to the, the a, a newspaper uh, in Washington, D.C. to say that, uh, you know, we have not elected Arnold Fischl, we do not want Arnold Fischl, and we, there aren't, uh, um, you know, there are barely 20 Jews in the entire um, uh, army corps, never mind in, in our, our regiment. What's going on here? And here again, uh, th this is the interesting part of the tale to me, is that Max Friedman uh, is soon himself drummed out of the army. He soon himself will, will, will leave the, the Union Army, in probably in disgrace. And he's doing again what probably many other uh, um, officers, colonels in the early part of the war are doing, which is uh, probably enlisting phantom soldiers and collecting their pay. Um, and he obviously doesn't want the attention uh, that this issue, this this call celeb is creating, uh, creates at this moment in time. So he's he's eager for for this for this issue to uh, to disappear. In fact, it probably has you know the the exactly what he fears comes to pass, which all this attention is directed on his regiment and and his and on his practices, and and therefore you know it's it's uh, in a bad news uh, for for him. So again, it's a much more tangled tale than than originally thought. But but the outcome is the same. That in fact the Jewish community does lobby Lincoln to change the law, and and you know, there is a considerable effort to do so, and ultimately that's exactly what happens. If Lincoln does intervene, Congress will change the law, and the, the act will be broadened to allow for, uh, for uh, um, uh, uh, those with a religious training in any, of any denomination to, to, become, to become chaplains. So we do in fact see then uh, Jews becoming chaplains uh, later in the war. So a very muddy backstory, but ultimately the results were good. Absolutely, indeed. Okay, so, so um, in brief, with the with the General Grant's order, um, were, were soldiers aware at the time of what had been done, and was there were they resentful of? You can describe what the order was, but also what, what was the awareness among the rank and file? Absolutely. So, so it's a very good question. Um, so, so the background is is this that that Grant um, is campaigning in uh, uh, down the Mississippi again, trying to capture Vicksburg, which is you know the effectively sort of a, a, a fortress controlling movement on on the Mississippi, Mississippi River. So, vitally important strategic uh, target. 
And it's a campaign which does not initially go well. This is in the latter months of, of 1862. In fact, there are repeated setbacks, disasters, disappointments uh, for, uh, for him. And one of the sources of irritation for, for Grant is the presence of, uh, of speculators and of traders who have been given permission by the Commerce Department to cross his lines, to cross, um, um, to travel with his army, but also then to cross into Confederate territory to, in order to buy cotton. And again, this is there's a tussle really between the War Department and the Commerce Department about this issue. The military obviously doesn't want these contractors, uh, these speculators, and these traders to do so, in that the fear is that they pass, they can pass information, intelligence onto the enemy, and also that they're buying cotton for gold and other valuables. And this, again, will prolong the war effort. So Grant is very upset by this, but he's lost, effectively lost that, that argument. Um, and um, so, so he's forced to put up with these, these uh, speculators and these, these traders. And again, unfortunately, channeling what I described earlier, the anti-Semitism on the home front uh, early in the war, uh, he begins to fulminate against, against Jews. Again, uh, making, a, uh, not even uh, implicitly, but explicitly uh, using uh, speculator and Jew interchangeably and becoming progressively enraged at, at the presence of these, these speculators and traders, you know, some of whom are Jewish, but certainly a minority of whom are, are Jewish. And he's not alone in this. We know that that his, uh, one of his key lieutenants, that uh, you know, General Sherman, is doing the same thing. In fact, his the, the anti-Semitism, which, which, which he produces, is even in a way worse than that of, of Grant. And um, it comes to a head in December of 1862. Um, and what probably precipitates this, uh, what becomes known as General Orders Number 11, is the arrival at, at his camp of his father, um, with whom Jesse Grant, with whom Ulysses has a very troublesome, difficult uh, relationship. And his father has actually entered into a business partnership with uh, Jewish brothers in Cincinnati, the, the Mack brothers, who are, in fact, uh, clothing suppliers to the Union Army as well, and this enrages uh, um, Ulysses S. Grant. And we, we again, there's a very good book about this by Jonathan Sarnab, but, but his argument, which I'm uh, echoing here, is that this probably persuades him to issue what what has been described by Jonathan Sarnab as the most notorious act of anti-Semitism, official anti-Semitism in American history. And it's effectively an expulsion order, saying that all Jews in the vast territory under Grant's command, which stretches from Mississippi the whole way to Illinois. Will have will have to leave within 24 hours, and uh, it's it, it's a, 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 a an order which is enforced in some places, mostly not because of of the the intervention of of of, of fate, um, and and obviously spurs a considerable Jewish response that that uh, the Jews go and rush to literally will rush to Washington to to protest uh, this this order, but for Jews in the Union Army, particularly those under um, Grant's command. It has exactly the effect of what you would expect, which is it's deeply, deeply disturbing uh, that this is a um, again a cause which they're being asked to potentially sacrifice their, their lives for a commanding officer who they put their lives and trust in, and yet they are they, they are being told that the Jews effectively are unwelcome, are being described as as this parasitical people, as this this uh, an, an unpatriotic. Uh, people so so, and interesting. We do have some cases of of Jews resigning, uh, resigning their commissions, for example, because of exactly uh, this. Um, and 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 others. An interesting uh, case: a soldier who we know a tremendous amount about because of the letters that he writes, wonderful letters that he writes home to his wife, which have been wonderfully uh, and are preserved and and are, have been published. Um, and and what's so striking about him is he's someone who writes about. Grant in very unfavorable terms earlier, that he, he's really quite dismissive of Grant's abilities as a general uh, in a, a prior to this point in time. But there's a sudden period of silence when it comes to, to talking about, about this order and about, about uh, you know, the, the politics of this moment in time. And, and my sense of it is that it is so shocking that it, it really silences him, it's something which he prefers to, 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 not, to not to talk about, at least to talk about with his wife. But again, there are hints elsewhere uh, that he's talking about it with his fellow officers and really again is, is very very angry about this he later by the way changes his mind about about grant when grant becomes very successful uh and when, when grant uh it, the, the the brilliant campaign which ultimately does take uh, uh vicksburg the, the following uh um, year um and and he he he's changes his mind and then he initially you know he's he's scornful of of grant and and now, he has only positive things to say about, for example, General McClellan, um, the, the you know, 
um, the disgraced um, another you know disgraced general who has political aspiration, uh, but 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 he later comes to 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 um, to to say that he actually wants to name one of his children after after Grant, and and uh, and it's connected with Grant's great successes as a military commander. And I guess later on, I think Grant regrets his decision. Do I remember that from Professor Sana's book? Absolutely so. That that's in fact it's something he he um, is not eager to talk about. But in a whole variety of symbolic ways, uh, he he recounts that he appoints uh, um, the Jews to high office. He uh, he visits a synagogue in Washington D.C. and and other things of, of this kind. And it's it's clearly I think a recognition. It's an interesting demonstration of of actually in some ways his his greatness uh, that he, his his uh, ability to see his wrong and to try and right it. Hmm. Oh, great, thank you. Uh, you brought a number of other slides. I think is there a, anything you want to draw attention to uh, in this context or or any other? Yeah, absolutely. I, I can show you some uh, and a few images here. Um, one um, we can look at. Well, we, we can get to this this particular uh, image of, of Jewish veterans uh, afterwards. But again, uh, an, an earlier image of of again depicting Jewish contractors later or contractors later in the war. And this uh, one, I think, one further back. This this over here again appearing in a mass market in a Harper's Weekly um, um, uh, magazine. Uh, which is widely circulated, and you can see again these the the uh, resonance and persistence of these ideas uh, that there are those who are patriotic and those who are unpatriotic during the war, and that some have sacrificed and some have not. And the contrast here is again between the soldier and the contractor, you know, the soldier and and those who who, who choose to profit on the, from the war. And Jews often, again, as I've already said to you, are are described during the war, imagined during the war as contractors, as speculators, as traders, as those who prefer to profit as opposed to um, to, to sacrifice for the cause. Mm -hmm. How many of the 1700 who served, um, we know it was a bloody war. How many, um, how many, uh, how many were shot and killed or injured or what was, what was the uh, survival rate? Sure. Sure. So, so um, as you, as you've correctly described, it's a very, it's a, it's a war, which is, is dangerous both on the battlefield, but also in terms of, of uh, life in camp. And, and, and here, particularly for soldiers um, who've grown up in the countryside, that that's being thrown together on mass introduces them to epidemic diseases which they have not encountered before and I, I speculate and here it's 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 real speculation then ironically that the Jews because they many of them are immigrants have come from from Europe have have lived amongst others have passed through larger cities probably are, are perhaps uh, better placed to 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 have been exposed to, you know, and, and perhaps have a certain amount of immunity to to some of the diseases which will take out large numbers of, of other of other soldiers but we know that the Jews uh, fall in in a, a large number of, of battles we I've, I've counted again and this these these figures are uh, um, I, I'm, I suspect are, are outdated um that have probably been updated since since I, I last looked the Jews fell at least at least 27 Jews fell in in, in battle and and in a, really in a, in a parade of all the major battles during the war so 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 you know again certainly at Gettysburg but a whole variety of other battles too and that's of course not counting those who are injured and and those who who uh who, who are maimed and and then will, will, will suffer from the war psychologically or physically for the, for the rest of their lives and again there's a one of the things that the the roster allows for is uh, it, it has a um, used uh, pension records as as a wonderful uh, source pension claims after the war and this again provides a, an extraordinary perspective on on the 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 long term consequences of the war for these you know, otherwise very ordinary for the most part very ordinary people who are who who enlist and and uh, a number of them are are enfeebled by 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 the war that they are they, they're wrecked. Uh, uh, physically, mentally, et cetera, uh, by this experience. The um, Your book is in some ways as much about what happens after the war as what happens during the war, because mostly because of the uses to which some of these, you know, facts and figures are put. Um, so I'm thinking about the status of Jews in America in, in, in the post-war period um, and how Jews and anti-Semites both use the war as either proof that indeed Jews are patriotic Americans, or the opposite, that somehow Jews shirk their duty. So what's the best way to tell that story? And I'm thinking a little bit about Simon Wolf and Mark Twain. Is that, sure. is that, is that part of yes, this? Absolutely. No, that, 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 that's a good, uh, um, a, a good things to, to focus on. Um, so, so again, here, uh, Jews are different from other, other groups. 
uh, that after the war, uh, the, the Irish and Germans and, and other and Scandinavians, African Americans will immediately celebrate their their war service. Uh, will um, will parade their their, their heroes, uh, their veterans, um, and use them as means, as the mechanism to demonstrate patriotism, to demonstrate that that we have sacrificed, that we therefore we are worthy of full inclusion in American society. Jews do something different, which again I think speaks to what we've already spoken about. It speaks to General Grant's General Orders Number Eleven, and speaks to that anti-Semitism early in the war. That Jews have much more difficult memories of, or have very difficult memories of the war, and I think immediately afterwards are eager to move on. They, they're not eager to talk about the war, mm. and uh, in fact, we, we only see uh, significant talk about the war amongst Jews in the 1880s and 1890s. So, so two decades or more after the war itself has ended. So the difference between Jews and and, and other other groups. Um, and uh, one of the reasons why Jews do begin to speak about the war again and begin to identify and then celebrate uh, Jews who had served in, in the war and, and identify you know, Jews who, who have, uh, for example, have won the Medal of Honor and, 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 and turns them into Jewish communal heroes. Um, uh, the, one of the reasons it, it does so is because of a, a tidal wave of anti-Semitism, particularly in the 1880s and 1890s, connected with the mass arrival of Eastern European Jewish immigrants, uh, that the, these uh, you know, um, new newcomers from the Russian Empire and from Romania who begin to arrive in America uh, are, are, are regarded by um, a number of, of Americans, a number of, in some cases, very prominent Americans, as unwelcome. And, and also um, there are a number of, of again, um, um, significant prominent uh, figures within American public life who begin to, to, to write and speak against the, against the, the open door policy when it comes to, to these, these immigrants, begin to, 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 for example, make the argument uh, that, that Jews and these, these immigrants can never be, become true and patriotic citizens of America because there's, they, they argue there's a history of Jews not being patriotic, a history of Jews uh, not signing up for, uh, to, to serve their countries. And um, one of these arguments is made by a very prominent uh, journalist and historian by the name of Goldwyn Smith, a, a, a very public figure who, who publishes a, a major essay on this topic. And one of his claims is that he has never that, that he's heard that there that that um, or in response to his his, uh, um, his essay a, a a veteran writes to uh, a letter to, to the magazine and says uh, he can remember no Jews or very few Jews who enlisted in the Union in Union Army and this this is picked up upon again this idea that that um, the war this the Civil War which is still which is a, a proving ground for patriotism it's it's in living memory of Americans in the 1880s and 1890s that if they did not fight, if Jews did not fight in that war, how can we trust these newcomers to become in future a patriotic, patriotic, a patriotic Americans? One of the people who picks up on this theme uh, it, towards the end of the 1890s is Mark Twain, you know, the celebrated writer. Uh, and, and he writes an essay called you know, Concerning the Jews. And uh, again, he, he repeats this, uh, th this claim that, that uh, Jews are, are averse uh, to, to, to enlisting in, in the armies. Of the countries in which which they they, they live, and 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 certainly Goldwyn Smith and and Twain's essay produce a a, a significant response within the Jewish community, mm -hmm. um, and and really it, it we, we see for the first time during the 1890s in particular, as I've already described to you, uh, the 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 uh, a prominent uh, or prominence being given to to Jewish veterans of the Civil War, and uh, we see the emergence at the same time of the. Of a, of a, a, a veterans association uh, representing Jewish veterans. Uh, we see the publication of a major book by, by Simon Wolf, uh, which uh, effectively lists uh, uh, Jews who have fought in not just the, the Civil War, but, but in, in earlier in the um, Revolutionary War and other conflicts as well. And all of this is, is, an, is a riposte, an attempt to push back against this claim that Jews are not patriotic. And, and as I've described to you, the Civil War is key in this argument that if you can demonstrate, if you can prove that Jews have fought in the Civil War, you can demonstrate that you know, these newcomers, these, these um, and those who will continue to flock to America's shores themselves can be trusted to be to be good citizens in the years ahead. Great, thank you. I want to take a look at a couple more slides because I saw I saw a really important mustache that <laughs> that I think we have to look at, and then I'm going to turn. I'm going to look at some of the questions in the uh, in the chat that some of the our, our viewers have uh, uh, put in. So let's just take a look at uh, some of these, and you can tell us what's going on. Sure, well, absolutely. So, so 
So th this is this is Isidore Isaacs uh, over here. Who, he's wearing his uniform of the Grand Army of the Republic. This is the the, the general um, um, uh, War Veterans Association. But he's also and he's a senior figure within that organization, but also is, is a, plays a formative role in the creation of the Hebrew Union Veterans Association. And you can see the 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 medals here of the Hebrew Union Veterans Association. And again, attempt to to again, create a Jewish identity around uh, around veterans and, and to, again, celebrate them as veterans uh, as well. And, and, and this is a, a, as I described, an organization which which is, uh, which, which appears, you know, again, um, in a, more than two decades after the war itself has, has ended in, during this very telling decade when, when it becomes important to, to recognize and celebrate a Jewish uh, war, uh, war service. Um, I can I can talk about potentially some of the other slides uh, as well. If we go back to to a, a previous one, uh, this if is someone a, had a question. This might be an easy question. Who was the highest ranking Jewish officer in the army, and and you know what, what was the, what was their war record? Sure. So um, there, uh, it's, so during the war itself, we see a, and this is in the Union Army, we see a number of of, of Jewish colonels and a number of Jewish uh, lieutenant colonels, and there are those who are breveted during and after the war in particular, who, who will be given sort of honorary higher ranks. But, but in effect, one of the interesting features of the Union Army, different from the Confederate Army, is this is the ceiling which, which Jews, uh, Jewish officers hit, that they, they, they're unable to, to rise beyond, um, beyond a colonel, the rank of, of colonel, in many cases, more often the lieutenant colonel. And I'll give you a, so we see it, for example, and uh, Someone like Max Friedman, who I talked about earlier, who raises a regiment early in the war, a number of other Jews who other who also raise regiments and become the colonels of regiments. Typically, though, they their experience is, is not that 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 positive. If we go back to a much, much earlier slide. There's a wonderful image of two, two brothers who are, um, if we go right back to the start, um. Here we go. The, the, these are uh, this, the, these are two brothers over here. These are the Eustasi brothers, um, Carl and Frederick Eustasi. They are Hungarians, and they raise uh, this regiment over here, the Garibaldi Guards, raised in in, in New York. Um, their experience is not unlike that of Max Friedman. That, that in fact. Um, Frederick Eustace will, will land up in prison uh, during the war, uh, again for for fraud, um, and um, uh, and this is typical of this this sort of experience. Is, as I said, not that uh, atypical of of the, the earliest wave of officers uh, who are often unprepared for the sort of very modern war they're going to encounter uh, during during the Civil War, and and are expecting instead a a, a rapid conflict. A, a, a expen expecting sort of glory without necessarily you know, uh, sacrifice. And um, so we see a number of these early officers who, who, who end the war in disgrace or have very um, you know, undistinguished careers. But the more interesting pattern are those who begin the war more humbly, uh, sometimes uh, not with uh, an officer rank, but sometimes with a, a junior officer rank, and then rising uh, quickly in, in rank because of their, their capabilities and command. And there's, there's a very good example of this. In fact, the, the, the man on the cover of the book, Edward Solomon, is an example of exactly this. He, he is someone who, who, who proves himself again and again, thank you, again and again in, in, in battle. Um, and he, he arises, he becomes the lieutenant colonel of his regiment, effectively commanding the regiment because the colonel is, 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 is injured. Um, and, and it's a, a case, it's, it's a regiment where, um, which, which fights in, uh, in the Atlanta campaign and then on the Sherman's March to the Sea and then likewise during the Carolinas campaign. And uh, it's, what's extraordinary about it is, is that Edward Solomon and his regiment has this uncanny ability to be at the, the key place, at the key moment in, in battle. Uh, so, so if you read accounts of, of a number of key moments, key battles during this campaign, there is the 82nd Illinois with Edward Solomon in command, who turned the tide at, at key engagements that they, and again, it's partly luck, but partly or so clearly he's a very capable officer. But what to me is striking is that he doesn't, he isn't rewarded with further advancement during the war. And I, and I suspect that that there, maybe it's not directly anti-Semitism, but I, but I don't think his Jewishness helps in, in any way, but he, he's rewarded after the war significantly uh, for, for his, his, his abilities and, and for, uh, again, by, by those who served uh, with him. And um, so, so, we, so we certainly see a number of, of Jewish uh, officers uh, who, who serve, but, but again, as I said, at the ceiling, which, which really holds them back from, from further advancement, again, different from the Irish and Germans, we see lots of 
of, of, uh, of higher ranking officers uh, uh, within, within, within those ethnic communities. A lot of folks are asking in the chat, and I was going to ask you the same, which is the your book is the first of, I guess, a projected two volumes. The first one focuses on the Union Army. But the, the experience, how do you expect the experience of soldiers in the Northern Army and, and the Confederate Army, the Union Army and the Confederate Army to differ? Um, I mean, it brings up all kinds of questions of complicity and, and patriotism. But it, it, I know it's a probably a subject for a whole nother hour, but but how do you expect your 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 research to kind of shift as you it's, it's, uh, you look at the South? No, absolutely. It's, it's a very good question. It's obviously been on my mind a lot over the last uh, number of months as, I, as I've as i been working on, on, on the uh, Jews in the, in the Confederate Army. And in, in truth, there, there are a whole variety of differences in, in experience. Uh, one is that we do actually see uh, Jews rising to positions of prominence, both within the Confederate Army. So, for example, the quartermaster general is, 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 is Jewish. Uh, likewise, Jews uh, having prominent positions in the Confederate government, I mean, most famously, Judah P. Benjamin as Secretary of War and then Secretary of State, et cetera. So, so, so that's, a, again, a striking difference. Um, likewise, um, we see uh, uh, differences in terms, I think, of, of enthusiasm as well. Uh, that, or at least, let me put it this way, I, think, I don't think enthusiasm, I think enlistment, that uh, Jewish uh, Jews in the Confederacy, as I described much, much earlier, um, enlist in much in a much larger proportion than those do in in the in the union, and some of them do so because of enthusiasm, without question. I think particularly those who are born in the in the south, those who've grown up in particularly in Charleston or Savannah and and and, uh, and the old south, um, uh, who, who've who've uh, been schooled uh, alongside um, uh, you know their fellow white southerners and, and really share the ethos and values of the of the broader society that they they enlist with enthusiasm they they rise in the ranks they're they're and accepted uh, by by their fellow soldiers um on the other hand uh, the reality is that many of those who who uh, live in the confederacy uh, during the war are actually newcomers as well they're, they're part of that same larger wave of immigration from from the, the german states from central europe and uh, there we see much more diffidence about the war. Um, yes, they enlist, but they do so because they are obliged to do so. It becomes very, very difficult to evade um, uh, conscription in the, in the Confederacy. And again, I've spent now months reading their letters and their diaries, and uh, these are in, in their memoirs. And what's fascinating about this is that, again, they, in many cases, in some cases, they, again, are enthusiastic, they will serve throughout the war, they will um, you know, absorb the values of the broader society, but others are, are very different right from the start, and um, try to, in fact, get out of service, um, rightfully see this as, as not being their fight, and, and will um, either, you know, um, I try to hire substitutes or, or will, will try to, 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 to leave the Confederacy if they can. And there are telling moments during the war which, which speak to this as well. There's, a, there's a, 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 an arch Jewish Confederate in, in Memphis who is scornful of his fellow Jews in, in Memphis um, and, and describes them as, uh, these are you know, Jewish merchants in, in Memphis, and describes them scornfully as being shipping agents. Why are they shipping agents? Because they're shipping their sons out of the Confederacy so they don't have to serve. And uh, to me, that's very telling. And I think that, that uh, you know, a lot of attention in terms of how the Jews, Jews in the Confederacy have been written about in the past have focused on, on the earlier category, on those who are enthusiastic, those who are very dedicated. And my sense is that there are probably more of those who are, who are diffident and, and don't regard this as, as they fight. And, and uh, you know, they, they certainly are patriotic up to a point. But when it becomes clear that this is a, a devastating war, a necessary war, they will, they will quietly try to remove themselves from the Confederate Army. Um, a lot of folks are asking about individual relatives or 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 uh, who would have served, and they have some of their records. Um, are, are, is Chappelle is the Chappelle archive still accepting? I don't know what you would call them. You know, historical artifacts to flesh out. Um, how, where, where do people go if they want to find out, or conversely, want to find out more about their relatives who served? Absolutely. So, so it's, uh, and, uh, um... The, the Chappelle roster is very much a work in progress and then by design. Uh, so, so there's still, um, the, the focus has now shifted to the Confederacy, but, but still we want to add as much material, as many additional names, or likewise edits and corrections for material we already have. 
uh, relating to Jews in the Union uh, too. And um, in fact, this has always been part of the methodology of, of the, the Schlerpel roster research team as well, as to try and reach out to, to families and individuals. Um, because again, it, it's seen as a, as a collective enterprise. Um, there is a representative of the of the research team who, who, whose focus is precisely this is engagement with, uh, with with families and and those who, whose whose ancestors fought in the Confederacy or, or the Union. And I'm very happy to put anyone in in touch uh, with uh, with her uh, um, in, in order to to help to facilitate uh, precisely this process. But very much we we want you know your information, your documents, your stories to add to that which we have already. Right. I dropped a. In the chat, I dropped a link to the to the roster, which if you click through, you should be able to find some of the contact information from there. Um, this is obviously a story of a all you know all male army. Um, it's a very, you know all male leadership. Are there women's stories in the roster or in your research that are important to talk about? And so again, a good question. So so the, the focus is, as you described, is very much on on the, the everyday experience of, of Jews in the army. So what is it like to to deal with you know, religious issues? What is it like to be a Jew and practice Judaism in the army? Uh, what is it like to face anti-Semitism, etc.? But obviously, these soldiers are very much interconnected with the with the home front as well, with their their wives and families uh, back home. And and certainly, and I've tried to reflect this in, in the book as well. The, the, these continued uh, connections that food parcels being sent uh, home, that that um, soldiers returning home on furlough uh, as well, that that this this sustains uh, soldiers within the field. And and again, it's it's both the the everyday that that you know soldiers their 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 diet is unvaried, their diet is boring, lots of pork, etc. And and they're desperate, longing for for things which connect them symbolically and physically with with homes. Likewise, they're requesting religious articles, requesting all sorts of other things to be sent from from home as well. So so there's very much this the sense that this is a this is a a mass volunteer army. These are otherwise, you know, these are civilian soldiers who, who are who are enlisting uh, in the army. And here again, here one of the the areas of of difference, perhaps with the Confederacy, that that yes, Union soldiers are uh, when they they um, uh, go to to towns which have been captured from towns and cities which have been captured from the the Confederacy. They will seek out fellow Jews and, and will have meals with them and then will again try to create community with them as well and often are, are well received by, by these you know, um, southern Jews. Um, but even more so in the Confederacy, and I think that, that that's, again, it's, it's the nature of the Confederate uh, war effort that, and, and the nature of the geography as well that, that you know, for example, Jewish soldiers who are in the Confederate army are, are not far from larger Jewish population centers in Petersburg and, and Richmond and elsewhere. And, and what I'm so struck by is how the frequency with which Jews are spending Shabbat, for example, with, uh, with Jewish families uh, on weekends or, or are, are making, again, these, these intense bonds of friendship and codependence during the war with, with fellow Jews because it, their, their Jewishness matters so much more in wartime. Hmm. So in the, we just have a few minutes left. Is there anything else you wanted to make sure we spoke about before, uh, before we wrap? Sure, I can, if, if we put up some of the images, I can at least point out some of the things which we, we've glanced through very, very uh, quickly. Um, and and uh, again, point you to, these are images which are drawn from the roster, which is beautifully illustrated. And and, and likewise, uh, and, uh, drawn some from the book as well. So here, you know, uh, the, the first image is a, of a flag, a regimental flag given by the Jewish ladies of Syracuse, New York, to a regiment. This is in September of 1862. So this is the a battle flag flown by by the, the this regiment. And, and we have another example from Chicago, again, of a regiment which effectively sponsored by Jews. We've already discussed uh, this image over here. Um, but perhaps if we, if we go to some of the the, the, the later images, I, um, uh, which point to um, a particular this issue of, of Kashrut, there's a wonderful image sent in, this one over here, sent in by a Jewish volunteer, Jewish soldier, to, to the New York Illustrated News, again, without any commentary uh, of a quartermaster supplies, again, a commentary on what a Hebrew volunteer is obliged to eat in the army. And you can see ham and pork and bacon and Jewish soldiers complain perpetually about this problem, that, that they that this unvarying diet, which is so heavy on, on pork, and again, imploring their families, you know, please send us uh, an, uh, other foods that we can eat. Right. Here again, a, a listing of, of Jews who, who fell in battle at, at the Battle of, of Fredericksburg. And not, again, 
Uh, not all these uh, individuals turn out to be Jewish, but you get a sense here of this is from a Jewish newspaper reporting this casualty list. And again, imagine the psychological effect on Jews who are reading this, that the, the casualties which are which are described here, that the, the you know um, those who are dead, but also the nature of, of the, the wounds which which uh, these uh, you know soldiers, Jewish soldiers are, are suffering. Again, this this is not something likely to persuade you that it's a wonderful idea to enlist in the in the Union Army. These are images, photographs by a man by the name of Philip Haas, an early a Jewish photographer. These are very unusual uh, um, in the photographs. These are taken from um, from from Charleston uh, during the. Those of you familiar with the the movie Glory, this is again the the siege of, of Fort Wagner uh, and and a, a, an image of the you know, Union the Union soldier, soldiers and from their bunker and also the the blockading squadron of Union ships offshore. And here we go. I've already spoken about Israel Isaacs. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, I will, there is a request to show the book again. Um, does it appear backwards? I never know how this works. Anyways, no, no, absolutely. <laughs> the name of the title is Jewish Soldiers. Uh, the title is Jewish Soldiers in the Civil War, the Union Army. It's by Adam D. Mendelssohn. Um, it's the first of a projected two volumes on Jewish soldiers who served in the Civil War. Adam, I want to thank you so much for taking the time and uh, enlightening us about this episode in Jewish history. Um, and I want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, we'll hope you'll tune in again uh, at the end of the month, February 27th. Uh, Sandra Fox, who is the author of a book on Jews of Summer, Summer Camp and Jewish Culture in Post-War America, which is exactly what it's about. Uh, we'll talk with Felissa Kramer of the Jewish Telegraphic Agency about this, this uh, distinctly Jewish rite of passage. But Adam, thank you again for, uh, for a terrific presentation. I look forward to um, sharing uh, this on other platforms. Uh, a recording will be available. Uh, thank you so much, and thank you all for listening.